Hey, how you doing everybody? This is John in another video of Traveling with John. Today we're in San Antonio, Texas and we're at the Casa Navarro house. Uh, Jose Antonio Navarro. This is his house. He was the signer of the Texas Independ Declaration of Independence. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead inside and get a ticket and check out the house. So the Casa Nora State Historic Site commemorates the life and times of legacy of Jose Antonio Navarro. Navarro, a famed Tijuana leader, legislator, and signer of the Texas Declaration of Independence, purchased the property in 1832 and completed construction of all buildings by 1855. The buildings which amplified the architecture typical early Texas statehood consist of Navarro's main house, <laughs> the mercantile building, and the kitchen. So we'll go inside and take a look. Texas has many heroes. Near the top of that list is Jose Antonio Navarro. Navarro was the most influential native-born Texan of the 19th century. He was a friend to Stephen F. Austin and a distinguished orator who helped shape the early years of the Republic in the state of Texas. His signature is near the top of the Texas Declaration of Independence, and he was hand-chosen by President Mirabeau Lamar to represent his country on a crucial training expedition to New Mexico and to increase popular support there for Texas. Among the qualities that made Jose Antonio Navarro a great Texan uh, were his pragmatism, uh, his devotion to the land of his birth. Navarro is best known for being a signer of the Texas Declaration of Independence. Jose Antonio Navarro was a merchant, a revolutionary, and a father, but he was first and foremost a Texan. He was a proud Tejano, and his patriotism and sacrifice shaped the course of Texas history. From an early age, he championed Mexican independence from Spain, and then Texas's independence from Mexico. Spanish was his native language, and without any formal university training, Navarro was renowned for his eloquence in writing. You can tell in his writing, in his ability to express himself, in the classical analogies that he often uses in his writing, uh, that he was well-read. Navarro was born in San Antonio in 1795 to a prominent Tejano family. He was successful in business and as a statesman, eventually serving Texas as a state senator. Navarro's fellow Tejanos of San Antonio elected him to sign the Texas Declaration of Independence. He helped draft key provisions in the 1845 Texas Constitution, including safeguards for voting and land rights for Tejano citizens. His apuntes históricos interesantes formed one of the first accounts of events in Texas history from a Tejano point of view. The apuntes are, are in effect, when he finished them, a history. A history of San Antonio. He was a merchant, rancher, land speculator, and statesman who traversed the dirt roads and wild range of the Texas frontier, despite a leg injury that left him with a severe lifelong limp. He was also successful in his legislative work, despite the fact that he had to work through a translator. Navarro never let his lack of formal education or his limited English skills deter him from reaching his goals. He is a model of resilience, tenacity, and loyalty for all Texans. Not only did he reason and speak with authority as an advocate for Tejano citizens, he used his legal knowledge to help craft the legislation that would ensure those rights. Navarro spoke and acted like a true Texas hero. This site brings to life the deeds and actions of this important leader. In the rooms and chambers of his historic home, you will learn about Navarro, his family, and his contributions to Texas history. With one original building dating to the 1830s, Casa Navarro is one of the last remnants of the historic Laredito neighborhood, the original West Side Barrio in San Antonio. Casa Navarro is constructed from adobe and caliche block, one of the oldest remaining examples of this building method in San Antonio. 
Navarro purchased the land in 1832 and resided here from the mid-1850s until his death at the site in 1871. Casa Navarro is a place, the only place, in San Antonio uh, where a visitor can go uh, to get a, uh, the full experience of, of what Tejano San Antonio was like in the middle of the 19th century. Um, so it is an extremely important historical site um, and it is a reminder that um, there was a San Antonio uh, that belonged to um, the population that had been there for a century. Casa Navarro and the Texas Historical Commission continue to tell the story of Navarro's life and accomplishments to its visitors today. I'm Sylvia Navarro Tillotson, founder and president of the Friends of Casa Navarro and a direct descendant of Jose Antonio Navarro. I'm proud to welcome you to the Casa Navarro State Historic Site, a remarkable home site that celebrates Jose Navarro's life in his pivotal role in Texas history. We hope you enjoy the immersive experience as you learn more about the life and accomplishments of an original hero of Texas. Okay, so after that short video that we saw, we're gonna be going into one of the buildings over here. And here we have a map of San Antonio. And in the small little red circle, you'll see where we are, the Casa Navarro House. This here is a well which was dug for water.
Jose Antonio Navarro sacrificed much for the Republic of Texas. His courage, dedication, and intellect shaped Texas history and affected the lives of his fellow Texanos and Anglos. Nunca podré olvidar cuando el presidente de la República de Texas. I could never forget when the president of the Republic of Texas asked me in my very home to join his expedition to Santa Fe. I was hesitant, but given my loyalty to Texas, I could not decline. It was the spring of 1841, and the coffers of the young republic ran dry. No one would lend us money. Claiming the Mexican lands east of the Rio Grande was the centerpiece of President Mirabal Lamar's foreign policy. Expansion meant increased commerce and desperately needed tax revenues. I rode with more than 320 dedicated men, including Captain William G. Cook, Captain Matthew Caldwell, and the expedition's chronicler, George Wilkins Campbell. We were five companies of men and 70 head of cattle. I was to act as a translator and to help in trade negotiations once we arrived in Santa Fe. Our supplies ran woefully short, and we were constantly hungry, thirsty, and lost. Thanks to God, we survived for four months, moving ever westward through the unrelenting plains. outside of Santa Fe in San Miguel, New Mexico, a force of Mexican soldiers overran our weary company. Being in no condition to fight, we had no choice but to surrender. Mexican authorities marched us to Mexico City, a 1,600-mile journey over harsh territory. Due to the lameness of my leg, I was allowed to ride in a mule cart for much of this journey, but my good fortune ended there. It was my fate to confront an old foe, Antonio Lopez de Santana, El Presidente de Mexico. I had met Santana when he was a young lieutenant stationed in San Antonio, where he took an interest in my sister, Maria Antonia. The Spanish Imperial Army was there under the command of General Arredondo. They executed hundreds of my fellow Tejanos for fighting for Mexican independence. Santa Ana eventually released every last one of the expedition members, but he would not liberate me. He made a simple but impossible demand that I, Jose Antonio Navarro, recant my allegiance to an independent Texas. I made my feelings known in a very stern letter. I wrote to Santa Ana, I have sworn to be a free Texan. I wrote, I shall not forswear. My letter incensed Santa Ana and he wished to have me executed as a traitor to Mexico. Santana wrote, Jose Antonio Navarro is an established traitor against his country, and as such is unworthy of any consideration whatever. He is deserving of the gallows. I was held in a Mexico City jail cell while I stood trial for treason. My case went all the way to the Mexican Supreme Court. Fortune smiled upon me as Santana was losing favor with his people. The court did not fulfill the wishes of El Presidente. I was convicted of treason, but they saved me from execution. However, Santana's reach was vast. He dispatched me to the dungeons of San Juan de Urua on the coast of Veracruz, Mexico, a wretched prison beyond the watchful eye of Mexican civil authority. I spent nearly four years as a prisoner of Santana due to my alleged treachery to Mexico. I was caged in a dungeon, and my suffering took a terrible toll. I later read a description of my physical appearance made by a fellow prisoner that chills me to the bone. Navarro's unshaven face was pale and haggard, his hair long and uncombed, and his clothing ragged and much soiled. It was difficult enduring those conditions. But by the grace of God, my friends and supporters, including the British ambassador, were finally able to secure my freedom. I escaped and left Veracruz on a ship to Havana, Cuba. From there, I went to New Orleans, 
where my old friend George W. Kendall had a doctor attend to me for two weeks. On January 29, 1845, I arrived in Galveston, where I was greeted with cheers. My fellow Texans applauded my return all along the route to San Antonio, where I joined my beloved family. I will confess this. The day I touched Texas soil was the happiest day of my life. Independence was a defining moment in Texas history. Jose Antonio Navarro was one of only two Tejanos selected to represent the citizens of Bear County at the convention at Washington on the Brazos. He risked everything to attend, and yet he signed his name for all to see on the document that severed Texas's formal ties with Mexico. Eran tiempos emocionantes, tanto que no lo puedo negar. Those were exciting times, such I cannot deny. But there was no peace in the midst of war. The revolution was well underway. We knew the Mexicans, led by General Santana, would eventually come for all of us who stood for a liberated Texas. But to see Texas freed, we had to act. The leading men of Texas had to speak with one voice to declare our independence from Mexico. Our brethren were under siege at the Alamo, and God only knew how long they could hold out for reinforcements. Action was required. Those of us who were not currently at arms convened at Washington on the Brazos with the sole intent of declaring our independence as a sovereign nation. The citizens of San Antonio elected my uncle Luis and myself to represent them at the convention, which was a great honor. Though my old leg injury would hamper the journey, and though my youngest child was but a year old, I left my home on February 20th, 1836. Colonel William B. Travis ordered that we be escorted by a company of four soldiers. We rode along the Camino Real. The wind and ice made traveling slow, yet we persevered. It took 10 days to travel 170 miles, but we arrived safely at Washington on the Brazos. It was hardly more than a frontier camp of a score of settlers. There wasn't a building large enough to serve as our meeting hall, but we bravely made do in an unfinished structure. There were no windows and very little separating us from the driving wind and rain. The convention proceeded in English, but several of the delegates spoke Spanish. My uncle and I required translation, yet we were wholly focused on every word and deed. Our good friend Lorenzo de Savada was bilingual and was of particular assistance in this regard. Together, we stayed up nearly until dawn, ensuring that the document we would sign was just and fair. My uncle Ruiz and I believed in the necessity of secession, yet our very attendance was an act of treason to Mexico. Had the Mexican army caught us, they would surely have marched us back to a Mexican jail and sentenced us to death. With the solemnity of great pride, I took the pen from Luis's hand and signed my name on that noble document. As we reflected on our accomplishment, word arrived from scouts of the final attack on the Alamo. So many of our fellow patriots fallen. We also learned that Santana's cavalry was making its way north toward our encampment. We Mexican-born were all too aware of how our actions would be viewed as treacherous. One of my fellow delegates, William Gray, later wrote on the night of March 17th that my Mexican friends are packing up with the intention of crossing the Brazos tonight. We left under the cover of darkness, beneath a cloud of great sorrow. Our hearts were heavy, but the revolution had to go on. We headed east to Nacogdoches, where we had friends and supporters. Thereafter, I set off for Louisiana to raise funds and organize support for our struggle for independence.
Francisco Ruiz was Jose Antonio Navarro's uncle and served as his lifelong mentor. Uncle Ruiz helped Navarro make education a priority and his ideals helped shape Navarro's political awareness. The two Tejanos played a pivotal role in the quest for Texas independence. It's difficult for me to recall the first time I came to the country. It is difficult for me to recollect when I first became aware of the vast intellectual energy of my uncle Francisco Ruiz. He shaped the boundaries of my every thought with word and deed. And it is to him that I owe my understanding of the principles of liberty and justice. I injured my leg in an accident rendering me lame for the remainder of my days. Soon after this misfortune, my father Angel died before my 14th year. Unsettling as these events were, Uncle Ruiz was there to support me. Ruiz was almost a man of education. He had been to Spain and studied with the learned and enlightened teachers of the continent. He would never let me accept that a limb, no matter how severe, could hamper my educational potential. His exuberance for ideas and for the rule of law set the course for my life. My uncle saw to my education from an early age, and for a time he was my teacher at our provincial school. In those days, my education might have been called superior. First and foremost, Uncle Ruiz taught me that one's thirst for learning must never be quenched. It was exhilarating being in his company. Though he was learned and wise, Uncle Ruiz was also a man of action. He could boast of extensive experience as a military man, serving Texas in our ongoing struggle for self-rule. He brought me along at age 18 when he rode against Spain in the insurrection of 1813, leading the cavalry against the Spanish General Arredondo in the Battle of Medina. General Arredondo arrived in the province of Bayer, furious and impatient to quiet the spirit of insurrection. Swords flashed, muskets fired, and many Tejano lives were lost. Spain was victorious extinguishing the hope of the Mexican patriots for a time. My mother, with her husband dead and her brother off to war, fled from the persecutions of General Arredondo and took her younger children to the interior of Mexico. In the other direction, my uncle Ruiz, my brother-in-law, Juan Martin Veramendi, my fellow Tejano rebels, and I made haste for the state of Louisiana, and my family was scattered and persecuted by so many disasters. This was the price we paid for our love of liberty. I was three years in exile before returning to San Antonio. Uncle Ruiz did not rejoin our family for several more years, not until 1821 when Spain at last branded Mexico her independence. Back in San Antonio, he would serve as city attorney and prosecutor. Under my uncle's tutelage, I studied law and continued immersing myself in commerce and trade. These were good times. I became a father, and we were a prosperous and fortunate family, with much involvement in the governance of our Mexican province. But the limits of Mexican democracy and the rise of the dictator Santana were bitter fruits. My uncle Ruiz glimpsed the inevitable, and he set me on a course for accepting an independent sovereign Texas. In 1835, Ruiz advised me to decline an invitation to represent Texas in the Mexican Congress. He told me that the die is cast, and that in a few months, the revolution that will forever separate Texas from the Republic of Mexico will begin. Do not go to the Senate in Mexico, he implored me, for you will only assist in quenching the dying embers of Mexican liberty. Soon after, we would travel together to Washington on the Brazos to sign the Texas Declaration of Independence, united in our pursuit of independence from Mexico. As I had all my life, I stood beside Uncle Ruiz with admiration for his character and deep devotion to liberty.
priority for the Navarro family. Education afforded early Texans valuable opportunities and avenues for success. Jose Navarro sought education for himself despite having few resources, and he passed on a legacy of education to his descendants. Cuando yo era niño, asistí a la escuela en Saltillo, México. When I was a child, I attended school in Saltillo, Mexico, where my grandfather, Manuela de la Peña, and many of my family on my mother's side resided. I attended school with my cousins and learned to read and write. But for the hand of God, I would have finished my primary education and taken up a mercantile apprenticeship or possibly joined the military. But in 1808, when I was 13, several events conspired to alter forever the course of my life. I injured my leg in an accident, an injury that never fully healed. As a teenage boy, I was disappointed to be cooped up and immobile. On the Mexican frontier, a young man's physical abilities were essential to survival and success. My injury, proving serious, would surely limit the avenues for my achievement. It was during my recovery that I would be shown my true path. Soon after returning to San Antonio, my dear father, Angel, passed from this world. Though he was sorely missed, there was little time to mourn. My family had to secure the means to maintain and improve our status in our provincial town. My mother's brother took a special interest in my future. I could not return to school in Saltillo. But my uncle Jose Francisco Ruiz made sure that I continued my studies under his personal direction. He afforded me the opportunity to overcome the limits of my injured leg. Uncle Ruiz was my teacher for a short time at the Bayer County School, but he soon moved on to more pressing governmental and commercial pursuits. Yet he made certain that I continued to study and apply my knowledge for the rest of my days. Through a curriculum devised by Uncle Ruiz, I attained a superior understanding of law that aided me in my service to Texas in the legislature and at important conventions. I so valued learning that I made certain my children received superior educations as well. I was justly proud of the accomplishments of my son Jose Angel Navarro III. He was the first Tejano and the third Texan to graduate with a law degree from Harvard College in Massachusetts. Angel became a successful lawyer and practiced law in San Antonio and Laredo. All of my children received formal educations. Early on, I advocated for public funding for education, helping to include such provisions in the Texas Constitution of 1845. I planted the seeds of education within my family in the hopes that they would share this love of learning and education with future generations. Okay, and there we go. We have the Casa Navarro house. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it was a little bit long, but I hope that the videos that they were shown here at the house was informative for you. And I hope that you check out my other videos. Subscribe, comment, and like. And I'll see you next time. Bye.